Hi, I'm Nadia Jarma, one of the grassroots voice members of Labour's National Executive Committee and a regular contributor to Labour Outlook. I'd like, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to this event, which will discuss the question, what drives Starmer's attacks on the left and Labour members' rights? The forum today is organised by Labour Outlook, which is a fast growing website bringing you daily news and views from across Labour's left and those at the forefront of resisting the Tories. The meeting this evening comes after a round of attacks on Labour Party democracy and a significant drift to the right on policy. We've seen debate and discussion close down and more recently the announcement that organisations will be prescribed and some members auto excluded. Whilst the attack on members' rights has continued, the party has retreated on important policies, for example, moving to the right on public sector pay and progressive taxation, watering down the Green New Deal in our last manifesto and failing to oppose attacks on civil liberties in the Spy Cops Bill and Overseas Operation Bill. One of the complaints I hear most from members is that, in their opinion, Starmer has betrayed his 10 pledges, particularly his pledge to unite the party. Some, after the recent prescriptions, have called the recent uh, moment for Kia his Kinnock moment. And we all know how Kinnock um, his moment went for him. And with the recent YouGov polling stating that 59% of all voters and 55% of Labour voters believing that Starmer is doing badly as a Labour leader, there's criticism inside and outside of the party. Why is that? Well, let's discuss. Tonight, we have a great panel for you. Our first speaker is Rachel Garnham, the Vice Chair of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy and a former Labour NEC member. Our second speaker is James Snyder. James was the co-founder of Momentum and a former Labour spokesperson and head of strategic communication under Jeremy Corbyn. And our final speaker is Maya Kirby from the campaigning organisation Save Our Socialists. And Maya is also a CLP secretary. We want to have as many questions and comments from the audience as possible because of the hundreds of you that are joining us tonight. We have volunteers who will facilitate the questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. So please post your comments for discussion and your questions to the speakers there. We will have time for a few rounds of questions from the audience after the speakers have spoken. Please note during the event, you can also tweet at Labour Outlook. Now for our first speaker, Rachel Garnham. Over to you, Rachel. Lovely. Thanks, Nadia. And thanks very much to Labour Outlook for inviting me to talk about what drives Starmer's attacks on the left and Labour members' rights. Um, I wanted to talk about three things, really, uh, going slightly beyond the title. So, so firstly, to, just to run through some of the attacks, primarily suspensions, crackdown on debate and the basically the demoralisation strategy. Um, secondly, what drives these attacks, which is, I think, primarily the, the, the ruling class <laughs> needing to avoid anything approaching the, the 2017 general election result ever happening again. And um, finally, what can we do about it and why we need to be in for the long haul and why it's worth it. Um, so what we've seen since Starmer became leader is sustained attacks on the left. Um, as people know, this started on day one with the sacking of most of the left from the shadow cabinet and from those positions on the NEC, followed shortly afterwards by Rebecca Long Bailey sacking um, primarily, it seems, because she was prepared to back the teaching unions where Starmer had made it clear he was not prepared to offer any opposition really to the, the Tories deadly COVID response. And we've we've seen the results of, of that with um hundreds of thousands of deaths, unnecessary deaths, because of um, Tory strategy and, and Starmer's lack of opposition. And um, with, with Starmer's victory, we lost our centre-left majority on the NEC. And during last summer, as a, an NEC member, we were constantly firefighting the, the attacks that were coming with, for a long time, members not even being allowed to meet. Um, and of course, the, the binning of the, the wonderful Jenny Formby and other excellent staff being forced out and the appointment of David Evans. Um, and from there, it went downhill further, peaking with the suspension of, of Jeremy Corbyn, um, a series of diktats from Evans cracking down on discussion within CLPs 
and the subsequent uh, suspension of hardworking volunteers who are obviously the lifeblood of our local parties. And I know Maya will talk about that more later. Um, and of course, Jeremy was cleared by our disciplinary processes, but remains outside the Parliamentary Labour Party as, as part of his punishment for essentially uh, uh, telling the truth and really a, a bullying campaign to make him fall into line and agree to things that he doesn't agree to. And, and that doesn't work with someone as principled as Jeremy. And it's um, Jeremy who brought so many members into the party and took us to our best election result for, for many years. So um, more recently, we've seen the continued use of Rule 2.1.4 to auto exclude members for spurious reasons. And that started last summer. This The, the prescription um, is essentially a codification of, of what had already been going on, um, which is you know, the expulsion without due process for many local members. Um, and so the, the, the NEC has sadly made it clear with the establishment of a new subcommittee that they will be back for more. And I think congratulations to Nadia and comrades on the NEC for making sure that those decisions do come back to the full NEC so they can be accountable. There is a point in having left representatives that progress can be made even when in a minority or at least um, some things can be defended. So that comes on top of regions taking over CLP AGM, selection process is um, essentially ensuring the left are excluded from um, positions, although that does seem to be patchy by, re by region and there's still a lot, lot to fight for. So it's what we've come to discuss, what drives these attacks, and I think that's best summed up by Tony Benn's quote that circulates on Twitter quite regularly. Um, and I, I did quote in a recent article for Labour Outlook, so I'm sure you're all regular readers will, will be more than familiar with it. But um, Tony Benn famously commented, if the Labour Party could be bullied or persuaded to denounce its Marxists, the media, having tasted blood, would demand next that it expelled all its socialists, and reunited the remaining Labour Party with the SDP, as it was then, this was 1982, but not much has changed, um, to form a harmless alternative to the Conservatives, which could then be allowed to take office now and then when the Conservatives fell out of favour with the public. Thus, British capitalism, it is argued, will be made safe forever and socialism will be squeezed off the national agenda. And of course, that's been, you know, Labour's reason for being for you know a hundred years or more to 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 challenge British capitalism and and have workers in parliament and an agenda for the working class so um, as I say that that remains true British capitalism does not want a Labour Party come into power which it can under the first past the post system that will provide any fundamental challenge to who holds the levers of power in this country um, after the Second World War with the, the 1945 Labour government with capitalism expanding, it was possible to both increase profits and make concessions to the working class. And there was there was plenty of pie to go around, if you like, now. And, and particularly since the economic crash of 2008, there is not so much pie to go around. And the, the capitalist class is absolutely focused on increased profits. And that means the political agenda that we've seen over the last decade or more of austerity and falling living standards. Um, I think under Ed Miliband, there were some, some nods to opposing this agenda, but when it came to it, there was the capitulation really to the, uh, the mainstream media and, and that agenda and the platform offered in 2015 was austerity light. And of course that culminated post 2015 with completely the wrong lessons being drawn from that election, that Labour needed to be tougher on the working class. And of course, it was it was Jeremy's vote against welfare cuts when the Labour position was to abstain. That was the, the catalyst for his successful campaign for leader against all the odds, because he was actually standing up for the, the majority of working people. Um, and I think because the, the ruling class had its way for so many years, it didn't really recognise what Jeremy offered and stood for and why he essentially inspired a new generation of voters and was able to put together the electoral coalition that was so effective that he prevented Theresa May gaining a majority Tory government in 2017, achieving, you know, people know the stats, but the highest share of the votes since 97, the biggest increase in Labour's votes since 1945. And if you look at the demographics of that coalition, he inspired young voters he got non-voters out voting and he catalyzed a switch um, from the Lib Dems and Greens to Labour. 
um, essentially building that anti-Tory majority that we need and which we need now and we're going in the wrong direction from. So I think the lesson was, was quickly learned by the establishment that um, the ruling class, whatever you want to call them, the section of the, the population that exploit working people for profit, that they, you know, they put their foot back on the pedal, they threw much more than the kitchen sink at Jeremy, um, primarily through a sort of demonisation campaign and obviously using the tools of Brexit as well to make sure that 2017 was not repeated in 2019. And that devastating defeat, um, what's happened is a continuation of making sure 2017 can't happen again, or as ensuring, as Tony Benn says, the Labour Party is made a harmless alternative to the Tories, keeps capitalism safe and unchallenged. And that's what's represented by Starmer and the Labour right, unfortunately, a, a slightly less right-wing capitalist party, one that might be more socially liberal, that doesn't cut quite so far or so fast, but what not one that that radically challenges um, inequalities. Um, so it's a it's a a part a Labour Party the mainstream media can get behind because it, it doesn't provide that real challenge to the establishment and um, not seriously challenge inequalities or profits and not defend the working class. So um, the first obstacle to this agenda of making the Labour Party safe for, for capitalism is, of course, firstly, the Labour membership. And uh, that's the mass membership that grew under Corbyn and the trade union membership, our affiliate, very important affiliated membership. And secondly, and related, of course, it's Labour's democratic structures, which enables that membership to um, make left ideas become policy, allows left representatives to be elected. And that's why essentially the Labour rights agenda is both to eliminate the left membership, both directly through expulsion and indirectly through demoralisation and to run down the democratic structures so that even when we do say, don't leave organised, stay and fight, um, voices are silenced. So undermining of CLP structures, targeting left MPs and um, councillors, potential council candidates, stitching up panels, shenanigans such as that went on with the London Regional Conference. Um, and we, through rule change that we will undoubtedly see at conference, which will roll back Labour's democratic structures if they can get away with it. And one to look out for is the reform of the Electoral College for, for leadership elections. So so far, so depressing, um, but there is hope and there are things we can do. So much as they would like to, the Labour right would like to ignore the rule book, it is still there and there has to be some regard to it. We still have left elected representatives. Annual conference is due to go ahead. We should be able to move our rule changes. In particular, we must build support for the rule change for to increase PLP accountability, which would restore the whip to Jeremy. Um, we need to um, move our policy motions to maintain advanced socialist agenda to make to try and make Keir Starmer attack the Tory party. We have one of the most right wing governments, the most right wing British government in living memory. And, um, you know, the, there is not enough opposition to it um, from the so-called opposition. So and the recent women's conference showed that the left can still assemble a majority for victory. Uh, and there is also, and you know, with its stunning victory in the Women's Committee elections and a whole series of left policies passed, and there is a an electoral incentive as well. Our electoral coalition is shattering under Starmer. However many people ideologically agree with Tory-like policies, which I don't think many particularly do, but they they were fooled, I think, by Starmer's electability um, promises councillors and MPs do not want to lose their seats and to a certain extent the left can appeal to that that self-interest because under Starmer Labour simply does not have the answers to the big crisis that we're facing with the pandemic climate change the young people's housing and um, jobs so what can we do let's get the vote out in the current CAC elections make sure we have our um, left representatives fighting for party democracy on that uh, sorry, Conference Arrangements Committee. Um, let's get the vote out for Steve Turner in the Unite um, elections, because if we lose the Unite from the left, that is a, a significant chunk of important um, people fighting for, for working people in the Labour Party. Um, let's get organised for conference, get those rule changes. Let's vote against the endorsement of David Evans, who's headed up all these attacks on the membership. Um, that is a right of conference and we have to vote on it. 
Um, let's stay in and not bow to their demoralization agenda. The analogy that always springs to mind for me is the, the tug of war between left and right. And although we're on the back foot, the harder we pull, the less easy it is for them to make the progress they want to. So let's not let go of the rope and lose all the progress we've made in the in the past five years. And let's build the, the anti-Tory electoral coalition we need to win a, a radical Labour government, because as someone once said, we are many, they are few. Wonderful contribution, Rachel. I'll let you slightly go over there because what you were saying was so important. Um, you know, you highlighted all of the attacks right from the get go of Starmer's um, leadership. And we got a real whistle stop tour there of what's happened over the last five to six years. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to say there's over 500 people watching us live tonight. Thank you for joining us. And there's bound to be over um, 10,000 views um, later this evening. So I'm going to quickly move on to our next speaker now and that's James. James over to you. Thank you Nadia and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so what drives their attacks? Well firstly I, I want to look at what they think that they're doing. So they think that they're making the party electable again. I mean you, you might laugh but that is what they think they're doing. Um, and that's based in part on this uh, idea called median voter theory, which basically views the electorate as one line and the median voter is just the one in the middle with the middle views and you win by just getting as close as possible to that median voter. Now, the problem with this theory is that it's been proven wrong in every single election in the UK since it, it, since, um, that it came up with it. But they still hold it to be true. So Blair gave an interview recently, Tony Blair gave an interview recently where he was sort of suggesting like it was the most simple and obvious thing in the world that you need to win over people who voted Tory, so you need to have Tory-like policies. Where, I mean, obviously 2017 showed that it is not the case, but also when you look at the polling for actually what, you know, a substantial chunk of people who voted Tory in the last election want, they don't want uh, a shift towards kind of managerial centrism and they, uh, you know, a lot, of, a big chunk will support some fairly left economic policies. Um, you know, we can see what they what they think they're doing from uh, Deborah Mattinson, who's the new um, director of strategy in Keir's office, uh, who used to work for Gordon Brown. She did a piece of work um, which has been well highlighted in Private Eye by Solomon Hughes for Harriet Harman when she was um, uh, interim leader in 2015 after Ed Miliband stood down which said that Labour needs to target the middle class, not the quote, undeserving poor. And another one of her um, stellar insights was that Labour should commission a review of its own economic performance by a Tory. So basically double down on the, um, you know, uh, we need to be austerity, you know, further into austerity and that Labour can't, Labour can't be trusted. It's all the same, you know, they all go in the same direction. Mandelson's idea that there's nowhere that any of these voters can, can go, which has of course been shown to be wrong with Labour losing three or four million uh, working class voters from 97 to 2010, the loss of Scotland, the, and then in 2019, um, the, the, the loss of parts of the so-called Red Wall. They're obsessed with this idea. In, for example, uh, Generation Left, the, the new um, sort of consensus view of, of for people who are, let's say, under 40 or under 45, which is very progressive on economic issues, on the climate, on racial justice and so on. Um, they want to basically modernise backwards to um, flip phones, uh, ill-fitting suits and West Wing, uh, West Wing reruns. I think um, is good. that's why they're obsessed with Keir, so so-called looking prime ministerial. Except, of course, you know Boris Johnson was just elected in a massive, in a in a big in a big landslide, and is well ahead of Keir on all of the ratings. And he's not prime ministerial in this kind of comfortable professional managerial class way that these people who are members of the professional managerial class, you know, they are lawyers, they are uh, you know senior civil servants, they're those sorts of things, management consultants. They, they want a leader that sort of looks like them. The other thing they think is that we live in a conservative country and they are wrong. You know, if you look at the, um, the polling on issue after issue, there is a nascent social democratic common sense in this country, which the Corbyn uh, project activated, particularly in 2017. 
you know, you see these Blair Wright retreads saying Labour must be the party of business and aspiration, but you look at the polling and they all say business is too powerful, they, you know, a large majority, they want higher taxes on the rich, higher, um, higher minimum wage, uh, and, and so on. So basically, we're being driven by a right who they think all of these things, but they somehow don't realise that they are wrong. And they will put new terms on it. It's always the same. You always hear the same thing, whether it was Mondeo man, Worcester woman, um, uh, Workington man, the Red Wall voter, Red Wall voters that voted, non-traditional Tory voters who voted Tory in 2019 and voted Leave in 2016 are the most to the left voter group, pretty much, in the, uh, on economic uh, issues. But anyway, they leave that aside quiet back people, whatever the demographic they want to call it, it's always the same solution. Move the party to the right, don't challenge, uh, don't challenge capital, don't challenge business, and be quite authoritarian and, and uh, you know, and have a kind of, um, firm thump of the, firm thump of the state. And that's lurking behind all of their things. But, you know, why, you know, what's behind all of that? That's what they think. So what, you know, why are they doing it? So partly there's some petty reasons. Let's start from the petty and then move to the more structural. The petty reasons are, OK, the five years or so where the left led the Labour Party was very frightening for a whole group of people who think that they have jobs secured in the Labour Party or positions in, in, in councils or in Parliament or so on, and they can just switch happily between those and private sector consultancies and all the rest of it. Um, and we, you know... The, one thing to realize is that when Jeremy was leader, that affected the job prospects of a substantial chunk of people who had thought that the Labour Party was their career, was their professional career, including lobbying the Labour Party from uh, from lobbyist companies. Because obviously it's quite difficult to lobby, you know, they tried. I mean, I was there, I saw them try it, but you know, it's quite difficult to lobby Jeremy to, you know, I <laughs> Support fracking. I mean, he's never going to support fracking. It's entirely pointless. So, if you're a former Labour MP or you're a former Labour staffer, why would you be hired by one of these lobbying companies in order to lobby the Labour Party to change its policy when they know it's stupid? So, part of the reason for the attacks on the left is a bitterness because we took something away from them. Part of it is due to this, the, the total inexperience of Keir's original team. I mean, really, you know, Jeremy's original team, we all know, you know, wasn't wasn't very experienced and wasn't expecting to. Uh, to lead, but you know, Kia's team likewise less experienced than the team that they replaced. Really, quite clueless and flapping around. And into that vacuum stepped the you know the the Blair Wright retreads, the the David Evanses, and so on. And you know, when they the the, the wheels were really coming off the operation, at the local elections in Hartlepool, they go back to Mandelson. Mandelson is signing off the the lines. And I think this is partly the further right to Kia. Kia has been a mask for them. haven't out how much he knows that he's been used by them or he's just a bit of a dupe and the the you know the the labor's anti-socialists are using him as a convenient uh, as a convenient front and then the other you know two other things that like like between i think i might only have two or three more minutes so i'll try to i'll try to wrap up um uh, is uh yeah, there's there's lobbying and donations and so on. You know, I've mentioned the lobbying thing a bit, but also the party's now trying to. It's lost two hundred thousand members or whatever it is. Uh, trade unions want to give it less money because of the change in political direction. So it's now going back to billionaires. Apparently, there's a piece in the Times you know wants to get money from the 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 CEO of Capita, the massive outsourcing giant. You know, what are they going to try to buy with that? We let, we currently have a policy for wholesale insourcing and democratizing of public services. You know, what, what are they what are they buying with it? And in order to do that, they'll have to they'll have to attack the left because the left will oppose that within the party. But there's a larger structural point about the Labour Party itself, which is it is an institution within society with a split nature. It has one foot in the progressive forces of society within you know, specifically the trade union movement, but also more broadly through the membership. And it has one foot in the state as part of the, uh, the, the ruling order to maintain society and to prop up existing power structures. So it's one part to challenge power, one part to basically protect power, which might be protect power through some reforms, 
but that's the that's the point so the party has conflict written through it by definition so the idea that we want that because left ideas are popular we wouldn't be attacked it doesn't understand the uh, the role that the party plays within society and the important, really vital role that it plays for, um, uh, as Rachel was saying, for, for the ruling class. Um, so, you know, that's why they try to deny the, the 2017 result, because if you were being rational, just straightforwardly rational, non-partisan within the party, and you wanted to look at how would we build an electoral coalition to win, your starting point would be 2017 and then expand out. You'd, you'd strip down the agenda, you would, we had, you know, we had too much, but you'd strip down to four or five main things, you'd develop big campaigns for them, and you would build a kind of big tent campaign for those, and it would have enough of a radical edge to excite uh, and mobilise um, uh, younger people, but it would be narrowed down so that it could be, it could be less attacked. That's what you would do from a kind of centre-left position if you just wanted, if you were Keir Starmer and you just wanted to be Prime Minister but he doesn't have the people around him who can do that. And it's not clear particularly what he wants. Um, do I have two minutes to say what I think we should do in response or have I gone over the top? I think you may have slightly gone over, but go on. I think it's important that you, you, you finish. All right, so just very, very quickly what we can do about it, right? So I understand why some people will say, all right, we've been beaten, let's leave the party, let, uh, let's move on. But I think that is a mistake uh, because, you know, firstly, there isn't another vehicle that can provide the, 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 the political um, cohering force that we need uh, across different parts of society. But the Labour Party still remains open to having a left leadership again, to expanding left um, representation in Parliament and very importantly in local government. You know, it's the most open bit. I mean, the, most Labour councillors are on the right. But it is the most open bit because there's mandatory reselection where we could have examples of uh, of local socialism. And I think we need and we need something else in order to try to keep people in. I think just saying stay and fight doesn't work because it sounds like stay, fight and lose. Because let's be honest, we are going to lose a lot of these battles for the next period of time. And they are trying to actively demoralize people. That's how they're going to force out most people. You know, the expulsions of a few people is because many more, more times that will just set um, up and leave. So I think what we need to do is bring together the various left forces in uh, in the party. So that is the left trade unions, the MPs, Momentum, CLPD and the others into a formal alliance with some kind of organisational form, which can then try to bring in the left of trade unions that aren't led from the left and then can try to engage with Black Lives Matter, XR, Sisters Uncut, these other forces in society, Palestine Solidarity Campaign and so on, and build one unified left force so people in the party can see, right, I'm in the party because of this. They can do their politics through what is going on. So rather than they just look at the news and what's coming out from the party, they see outrage after outrage, cowardice after cowardice, there is something that they can engage with. And you can see that the, the um, advance of the progressive forces in society, which we've had over the last six years, much larger progressive common sense, loads of people can organize, loads of people are engaged in campaigns, that those things stand a chance of being greater than the sum of their parts, can w have wins in society, and at some point can take back the Labour Party and really transform it into the kind of thoroughgoing movement party that we need it to be. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you for that analysis, James. Um, really important points there. Um, and I think it's also really important to tell um, people why um, it's important to stay involved. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I, I'm told we've now got 650 people watching us. Um, we've got people from Portugal, Belgium, Liverpool, Sheffield, Tunbridge Wells, right across the country so thank you for joining us this evening um so i'm now going to hand over to one of our uh, labor outlook contributors patrick the wonderful patrick foley is going to tell us a little bit more about how you can help um, the organizers of today's event how you can support them so patrick thanks for that nadia i really appreciate that and um thanks for all of you for joining us uh, us this evening it's, it's quite inspiring to hear so many people joining 
at a meeting that was only announced about a week and a half ago um, and to have people coming from all across the country in different countries as well it's just it's great to see that there's so many people willing to stay and be active in the Labour Party. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Patrick Foley, I'm from Labour Outlook and from Arise Festival uh, and I just wanted to go over a few things before we continue. Um, first of all, we couldn't do any of this without your support. Hosting and organising events, running a positive left-wing news outlet that gives a voice to those taking the fight to the Tories on the front line. Um, it's, it's done with a really small team uh, on a very small budget. So we, we, we always, at this point in the meeting, would uh, ask for donations. So if any of you uh, are able to donate, there's going to be a link going through the chat from some of our volunteers. Um, and we're just asking for £10 or whatever you can give. And if everyone on this call gave £10, we'd be able to cover the cost of this meeting and already be on the way to, to hosting another one in the future. So thanks for joining us and thank you for donating those of you who are doing that now. Um, secondly, I'd like to let you know of a few things that are coming up. Um, we've got an Arise Festival rally taking place on September 11th, Saturday, September 11th. Um, and that's going to be with some high profile speakers from our trade union movement. It's going to be uh, with some left uh, MPs, including John McDonnell, Diane Abbott, Richard Berg and John Trickett, and also a number of voices uh, from the front line, including Holly Turner from NHS Workers so, uh, Say No. Um, so again, the, the details will be posted in the chat. Uh, so do please go check that out and register as well. Uh, we've also got a fringe coming up at Labour Party conference. So for those of you who are going to conference, the physical conference this year, uh, I'll be seeing you there. And uh, if you've been before, you'll, you'll know about the Labour, Labour Assembly Fringe. Um, it's, it's a fantastic event. It's always one of the busiest ones there. Uh, we've got great MPs, again, trade union voices. Uh, just to name a few, we have Rebecca Long-Bailey. We have Steve Turner from Unite, Mark Sawatka, uh, Sarah Woolley from uh, The Bakers, uh, and yeah, many, many more. So again, just, just go and check that out. That's happening on September 26th. Uh, during conference so if you go to the to the page you can you can find out how you can take part and uh, I would recommend you to get there early because the seats go fast uh, and and the final event I'd like to talk about is um, something that Arise is proud to be supporting which is a, a major international solidarity event uh, taking place on August 18th and that's with speakers from across the region from Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Argentina and more. Uh, we'll be hearing from the former foreign minister of Ecuador Guillaume Long. We have a Peruvian journalist uh, called Francis Francesca Emmanuel, who will be giving us an update on the historic victory for the left recently. Uh, and again, you can check out those details in the chat. And that's uh, that we posted if you're watching on YouTube as well as on the Zoom here. Um, there's a few other little things I'd like to say that, you know, we've also been running a Restore the Whip to Jeremy Corbyn petition. We're very close to 50,000, so I know a lot of you will have signed that already, but if you haven't signed that, please go ahead and sign that. Uh, it's really important we show that there's a huge level of support for him and that his, his, we need the, the whip reinstated to him. The fact that he's a sitting Labour member, uh, he's a Labour member, but not a sitting Labour MP is, is frankly ridiculous and it's about time they, they let him back in. Um, and I'd just like to end on this. I mean, a lot of you will already be following Labour Outlook, but it's, a, it's been a, a fantastic thing to be a part of, uh, to be part of a left wing outlet that gives a voice to movements, to, to, to left wing voices that frankly is so needed at the moment, especially when Keir Starmer is sidelining us, uh, when the country really needs a progressive outlet and really needs voices that are taking the fight directly to the Tories. So please follow us on social media. Keep an eye out for all of our articles, be, be, share them, like them, pass them on your WhatsApp chats. Um, and that's one way we can really build this movement is just by being together and sharing information together through positive outlets like Labour Outlook. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I'm going to go back over to Nadia. Thank you. Thank you for that, Patrick, and thank you for all the work that you do. OK, so we're now going to go to our final speaker, Maya, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I Just what Rachel and James have said so far is so interesting. I mean, I completely agree with Rachel. Fundamentally, the Labour right don't want to challenge inequalities. Um, but I also think that what James said about being motivated by petty self-interest is is right you know they want to marginalize the left in order to retain control of the party they've 
got a view of the party and their role in the party in a kind of as a kind of paternal role you know they're the managers uh, they're the sensible managers and we're the children you know they know how um politics should be done they're the managers of politics and it's a sort of you know, post-colonial you know, idea of how you do politics and we've not been about that you know we've been a movement and we need to continue to view ourselves in that way and get not get so bogged down in the kind of power and identity which motivates them um, and I suppose you know a, a very a certain well-known and outspoken uh, labour right activist said very early on um, if you marginalise the left they give up um, and it's very depressing. <laughs> um, so this is why they've chosen, um, this is their, their tactic. And, and just as James and, and Rachel have said, uh, using suspensions, um, you know, bureaucratic stitch ups in order to, to do that. But I think, you know, at the bottom of it, what drives them? Why are they doing this? Why did they choose? Why did they choose to attack us? Uh, why do they choose division rather than unity? And I think really the answer is, is that they are weak. They have no policy ideas. Look at London Regional Conference. Um, the left brought the policy. The right didn't bring policy to that conference. You know, they're only interested in building in retaining control of the councillor appeals uh, process. Um, Apart, apart from a few exceptions, they've got really minimal reappearance on the ground in the CLPs. Um, it's the same people who we were seeing in 2015. A lot of the reason they've taken over CLPs is because the left have left. Um, and I think also that their coalition is built on opposition to us. They've got little holding them together apart from their hatred of us. So they need us. You know, we're the, the enemy that holds their coalition together. Um, and so I suppose it's very, very tempting to see this weakness and think, you know what, I'm going to leave the party. I uh, just want to watch them crash and burn. Uh, we know which way it's going, you know. Um, but I obviously don't think we should do that at all. Uh, and I think that our biggest problem is going to be overcoming demoralisation. Um, and to do this, I think we've got to take a kind of broader historical perspective on what we've built and what where we want to be. Um, and I know uh, Rachel um, has talked really well about what we can do on a national level. And I suppose that I'm coming at this uh, and, and, and was thinking about this in terms of what we did locally and what we've done as a CLP. Um, and uh, one of the most important things um, is that we built a community um, and that community has actually made some fantastic relationships with local uh, trade unions and local organizations and campaigns. So for example, a couple of months ago, we were uh, involved in a picket line um, at a special educational needs school that was privately run. Um, and one long-term Labour member said, I haven't seen you know, turnout at picket line like this in Hackney uh, since the eighties. And the bulk, the main bulk of the people on that picket line were Labour Party members. So these are us, you know, that we built this presence uh, at local disputes and we won that dispute um, and we can continue to do that. And that's fantastic. Um, and, and our network in the CLP, our access to thousands of members, we're big Labour Party uh, CLP, um, is really invaluable for making sure that we you know, push those campaigns to a wide audience, uh, which the Labour right would not have done when they controlled our CLP. Um, I suppose the other thing that I wanted to say that, you know, the reason that it's really important for us to stay in the party is the political education that comes from being an active member of the party. Uh, I mean, I just in my time in the CLP, I've learned so much about different policy areas. Uh, and then when it crops up in day to day life, you know, I've got an understanding of those um, those, those policy areas, thanks to my comrades who've brought motions, discussions, speakers who've come. It's such an important uh, part of life to, con to, to be constantly uh, open and have, uh, have access to this kind of um, political education about current affairs, but also, you know, about uh, more uh, different ideas. Um, and that's something that I'm so grateful for having been a, a Labour Party activist. And finally, I want to say as well that 
activism itself is not something that is just easy to get into. And being in the CLP has really shown me that we can create activism and it and um, it gives us an ability to, to do that, to make events, to, to create networks, to um, build, build campaigns. Um, so I suppose my, my um, main point in this is, yes, it's awful. It's really demoralizing. It's, it's horrible. And they are attacking us in the way they know that they think they can, they can defeat us by killing hope. But we have to take a broad view of this and think, it, what we have achieved and what we can continue to achieve, um, uh, you know, staying together. And we are still a significant force within the Labour Party and we should, we should hold on to each other. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Mike. It's great to have a grassroots voice literally from the floor. So thank you for coming along tonight. Okay, so I'm gonna go into um, some questions. So we'll do two rounds um, and obviously come in, um, you know, as you wish, we can do it in the order or whoever feels that they want to answer. Um, so I'll do two questions first. Um, James, I don't know, um, you, you dipped out a couple of times um, on I'll your broad... my internet. Brilliant. Okay. Um, just don't want to make sure that we can hear, want to make sure we can hear you. Okay. So first two questions to the, to the uh, speaker. So, um, the Labour leaks show us that racism is a problem in the higher structures of the Labour Party and demonstrates the need for self-organised stru structures in the party. How can we strengthen those structures and what do you think the right has historically reacted against them oh sorry and why do you think the right has historically reacted against them um, and then the second question is what do you think is the connection between attacks on the membership and the gallop to the right we've seen on so many policy issues so who wants to come in first on those yeah I don't Rachel mind. yeah um although Possibly you, Nadia, can answer the question about how we're getting on with the self-organised structures, um, because um, I think one of the great outcomes of uh, the 2018 Democracy Review was to reinvigorate our women's structures and to put in place the, the, the groundwork for um, disability structures and Black, Asian and minority ethnic structures. Um, and it has been a very long and painful process and it, but it is still going on. And um, I think there are some, there are many barriers and I think it was implied in the question. Sorry, I, did, I was trying to scribble it down, didn't, didn't quite catch all of it, but I think um, historically self-organized structures within the Labour Party, the women's sections and the black sections within in the eighties, um were um trailblazers you know they it was the women's sections that fought and fought and fought again for all women shortlists when you know there was only a handful of um women mps and have fought for women's rights within the labor party and it was so it's been so encouraging um in telford in 20 19 now and then in our conference over the summer to see women getting back involved speaking about their experiences as women and passing a whole series of left policies and really sort of proud to be involved in that from CLPD putting forward our sort of model motions on on climate justice and the impact that that the climate change has on women and on Palestine and then um, you know a whole series of of motion. So how do we strengthen them? We support our NEC members in who are actually working on this. We um, try and put forward rule changes that will establish them. We have rules for um, Black, Asian, minority ethnic branches, for disability branches, for women's branches. We get together as you know, within those groups, uh, you know, I know in sort of my region, for example, people are working together to work out how we build our women's branches on the ground. Um, and we build them from the bottom up and then we support the people at the top to, to democratise, um, to make sure those those things have, uh, those structures have a voice. And I think in particular for, for women, you know, we did win that we could send motions to annual conference and therefore it, we should absolutely be hearing from those other equality structures motions at conference and that that sort of thing and then on policy issues uh, it, it's no coincidence that you know a crackdown on members means of a shift to the right because members 
are so, and voters more important not more importantly but as importantly support our left policies that were in the 2019 uh, manifesto you know on nationalization um on um investment in social housing uh, you know all our key um policies had broad support for across not just labor voters but you know lib dem voters and some tory voters as well and um but comes back to some of those vested interests, doesn't it? I mean, you know, it was the Blair government that introduced foundation hospitals and, and academies into, so basically introduced the, and PFI, you know, introducing private sector into, um, into our public services. And th those are vested interests, so, but they're not in the interests of the many. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we have to keep fighting for those policies. But as, as Nadia said, at London conference, at, um, uh, at women's conference, those policies, they just, they keep going through because they are the right response and they are popular. Thank you, Rachel. James, do you want to come in next? I that was a great answer. I don't I don't have I don't have masses to I don't have masses to add to it. Um, I mean, the reason why the self-organizing is opposed is because it can't be controlled. And that, yeah, that's the case always. That's why that that's why it's so important. Um, and and yeah, exactly as Rachel said, it's no coincidence. It's no coincidence whatsoever. I mean, it's trying. They are trying to construct a different type of party. It's a different type of party that where the membership is at best uh, cheerleaders for um, uh, for the you know cheerleaders for the red time Westminster and door knockers for the red rosette at election time and nothing in between, maybe sharing some posts on social media or whatever. But, um, and uh, that is the type of hollowed out party that can pursue kind of, you know, centrist managerial technocratic, the, the, the centrist managerial technocratic politics that they think are, are sensible. The problem for them is twofold. One is financial. You know, the party, because the party isn't going to be in power, you know, why there's no Bernie Eccleston turning up because what is he, you know, giving a million quid because what's he buying? You know, they're, 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 the big donors aren't turning up. They're driving the members out. The party's, uh, in, you know, in real financial difficulty. And then the much more important thing is, is electorally. You know, this is not 1995. The... the the, the, the world is the world is very different and the things that people want are not people that look like politicians in suits who look like they're lying on TV being evasive not saying what they think giving politician answers to everything like I want our children to have the best schools well who doesn't want the children to have the best schools you know saying basically vacuous politician speak nonsense but you look serious and you and you show that you're safe because you're attacking the left. That's not what uh, that's not where the electorate is. That's not where the majority of society is, which is why it's not winning. I mean, they could win by default. They could win by accident. You know, the, the if there was some real implosion for the Tories, but some real implosion, which means more than a 20 percent fall in GDP and more than 150,000 people dying, including tens of thousands of people unnecessarily by for example, sending people with COVID into care homes, killing tens of thousands of, of, of older people, giving billions out, you know, all of the absolute mayhem of the last, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the last year or uh, year or so, but some greater collapse, some greater mishandling, and then maybe they win by default. But it's not a, it's not a program to win um, because people actually want you. Thank you, James. Maya? Do you want to come in? I would just say really quite similar that, you know, that we live in a time of, uh, you know, having had 10 years of austerity, it's miserable. And uh, they know uh, popular policies uh, like in the 2017, 2019 uh, manifesto are uh, popular. And uh, that uh, really, if they get rid of left voices, then it's easier for them to water down uh, these radical policies um, because they're not exposing themselves um, so much and those are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you and, and I think it's actually it's 
it's important to remind people that our last two manifestos, which I think were amazing, would only have brought us in line with our European, um, you know, other European countries like France and Germany. So, you know, radical, but actually, we were just bringing us in line with what other people are already seeing and doing. So, but I do agree. I think James made the good point earlier about, you know, we should start, if people were really, um serious about being in government they should go back to what worked in 2017 and build on that okay right so just before we go into the second round of questions I'm just going to do some um, concluding remarks um, so I just want to thank everybody um, for taking part this evening our speakers I think you've been awesome and amazing so thank you um, I just want to say if you can please make a donation so that Labour Outlook can increase its web presence and organise more events. As Patrick said earlier, we would really appreciate that. Please make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And obviously, we um, would hope that if you've enjoyed tonight, you will come along to the Arise Festival, um, which is the sister organisation rally that's going to take place at 2pm on Saturday, the 11th of September, with the who's who of the left. We've got John McDonnell, Diane Abbott, Richard Bergen, John Trickett, Shami Chakrabarti, and many, many others. And obviously, you will have seen the links to that in the chat. So please do make sure that you've registered for that. OK, so final questions to the panel. There's just three quick questions. Um, and then obviously, if you could use that to sum up as well, um, and then we'll be ready to close. So um, the Labour Party has at times felt very inhospitable for socialists. What's your message to members who feel they should go? Um, a request from the team behind the reinstate Jeremy Corbyn page and petition. Can the speakers sum up in 30 seconds why they think the whip should be restored to Jeremy? And the final one is what can members and local activists do, especially in right wing dominated CLPs? How can they organise themselves? So should we go to Rachel first for those? Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief, but that's a, that's a lot to cover. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to Nadia for chairing tonight and also for all the brilliant work you're doing on the NEC because um, I know how tough it is, but it's really important to know that you're you're there and um, being a voice for us all. Um, the message um, to members about um, staying or going, um, I, I refer you to my <laughs> earlier analogy of the tug of war. We are stronger together and we have to keep holding on and if you need to take your hands off the rope for a bit that's fine but we'll still be there um, and we need to maintain that 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 critical mass because we still have democratic structures we can still win things we are stopping the inexorable march to the right that some some would like to in our each in our own small way and um you know if people need to i think it sort of links to what can you do in right-wing clps and and sometimes the answer is not very much, sadly, but you can join with fellow members in, in CLPD or in Momentum or in Save Our Socialists or in like our regional Labour left groups and share ideas, educate ourselves politically, support our candidates. You can vote in the Conference Arrangements Committee um, elections by the 13th of, of August and really make a difference because every vote will count. If you are a member of Unite, you can vote in the, in the, um, uh, the General Secretary election. So there, there are many things you can do and it doesn't always mean banging your head against a brick wall at a CLP meeting. And if, you, if that's not working for you, step away but maybe you can organize a women's branch or a disabled members branch or a, a black and asian minority ethnic branch across clps or a forum if you can't get it recognized work together um, and we can we can make a difference um jeremy corbyn the whip should be restored because he has been clear through our disciplinary processes there is no reason he is a labor member and he is an mp and he has offered inspiration to a a generation of people. He has achieved, he led us to our best election result in uh, many, many years. And we are stronger together. Keir promised unity. Let's see it delivered. The, the biggest message he could say that, yeah, we're a united party is by readmitting Jeremy to the PLP. And um, absolutely has, has to happen. Um, I think just three final points. One, we've got to stress the electoral arguments that what Keir is doing is not electable. Many people voted for Keir thinking 
this is electability. It isn't let's learn the lessons from the European Social Democratic parties and from our fantastic election results in Wales, where they have a left Labour leader. Um, let's keep fighting on, on many fronts. I was inspired by what Maya said about working locally and remembering my, um, my actually the most pleasant experience of campaigning tends to be your local campaigns for, um, for example, you know, around rail accessibility in my local area or, you know, the, the women's forum picnic, you know, the, these are nice ways to connect with left people, but let's, let's get organised for annual conference too and regional conferences and let's work together on the left. We have more in common than what divides us and we care about the Labour Party and we care about um, challenging inequalities. So let's work together across our groups, across the country, um, across the regions and nations to do that. Because yeah, we are we are many. They are few, and we can do this. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. And as I should have said earlier, the um, the structures for the Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. Um, new structures have been signed off and I know that the um, the rep on the CL uh, on the NEC is trying to see if a conference can be had this year we're working on the anti-black racism definition so there is things happening I attended uh, a working group for the disabled member structures today you know we've got a brilliant chair there Ellen Morrison um, really fighting the corner for disabled members so that will absolutely um, you know move forward as well so there's a lot of stuff that is happening. Um, OK, so thanks for that, Rachel. We'll go to James and then Maya. So on the whip, I mean, Rachel said it, it's absurd. He's a, he's a Labour member and he's an MP, so he should be a Labour MP. I mean, that, that, that's about it. I mean, and then there's, of course, there's all the other stuff. It's absurd. Keir wins uh, on his um, fake unity programme and then kicks his predecessor out of the party. I mean, you basically couldn't write it in a Geoffrey Archer novel. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, Jeremy, of course, should, um, uh, should, 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 should come back in and the Labour Party will be better and stronger when he does. Labour's poll ratings and Keir's personal ratings have all been on the slide pretty much since Jeremy was kicked out of the PLP. I think there's indirect, not direct causation, but 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 nevertheless. Um, on the other two questions, I think I'll I'll try to answer them together, which is sort of what should people do type thing. You know, what should people do in hostile circumstances, whether it's in the party or in a particular bit of the party. And I think you know this is actually something that we should have done much much more when we you know when we were in charge of more of the party and it, it was more hospitable is. A monthly meeting within the party shouldn't be what our politics are. That's not how we do our politics. Our politics are, are organising in society. That should be the main bulk of our political work. Now, whatever it, campaigns or types of organising you're involved in, it doesn't matter because we need all of them. You know, whether you're doing tenants organising, you're doing workplace organising, you're campaigning for a Green New Deal, you're working for public ownership of, uh, of rail, you're part of the feminist movement, you're part of Black Lives Matter, whatever it might be, you know, those are, those building those movements and connecting them to the, to the party, the movements are the fundamental forces in society and those are the ways in which we do our politics. And if that is our main political activity, and it, okay, fine, most of it isn't going through the party, but it me makes turning up you know, once a month, once every two months, when you get a text from someone saying, we really need you to come and vote on this thing, it's for this, much more bearable and much more possible because you know why you're doing it. You're not saying this is the sum total of my political activity. It's I'm doing this for a particular reason. It is, it is to do this thing. So, and I think we then have much more credibility with people to say, no, stay in the party. Look, I'm staying in the party for this reason. I'm still doing all this other stuff. You know, it's not like I'm, uh, I'm I'm just banging my head against the wall, turning up to one or two meetings a month, getting shouted down, losing the votes and going away again with my head in my hands. I'm out there doing this, that and the other. And, you know, we do, we, we need to uh, have you still in the party and coming to vote on things because they want to put the left in a sealed tomb and bury it. And preferably, you know, they the right. In fact, they'd rather put up, put the left seal tomb and throw it into a volcano and have us never come out ever again and that means that we need to have people who are not involved in the the month-to-month the, the -month activity 
party who can come and vote on the key things that stop um, then changing the leadership rules to lock out the left, lock out members, changing um, you know, the NEC getting a, a super majority on the right so that they can block left um, candidates selected as parliamentary candidates and to stop them changing the, uh, the rules that allow um, for councillors to have um, a, you know, a form of primary so that we can get in um, more left and grassroots councillors. So I think we need to you know, we need to recognise where we are in the party, not be so depressed about it, because there is so much going on in society, which is extremely, extremely exciting. You know, the, the ruling class do not have control over the situation. They've regained control over a lot of the political process. You know, their, their team A has a, an 80 majority and is doing very well, thank you very much. Its team B is rushing back towards it and wants to buttress the, the, the established order and seek mild concessions rather than challenge it. OK, fine. But there is a social democratic common sense that uh, throughout the country, there is an anti-racist common sense for the majority of the country. Look at the response to the, uh, the England team and the penalties and, and so on. I mean, like, yes, there is a there is a vicious vociferous racist minority in the country but that is driving a polarization where we are actually in the majority and you we can see this on issue after issue the space for us to organize and act politically is very large and we just need to take that energy and hold our space in the labor party so that at some point we can we can advance somewhat in it and at some point we can have that back as a vehicle for the fundamental transformation because we do need a party because we need to get into the state. The state is the most powerful weapon that the forces of the few have, and we won't be able to fundamentally shift the balance of power in favor of the many and away from the few if we aren't able to enter the state. So we do need to have an idea for party, but right now, I think the way that people stay energized and focused is just, there's so much stuff going on out there. Get involved and stay, and stay involved and don't let that mean that you think, well, there's no point being in the party because it doesn't represent you. The party, political party, is not meant to represent you. It's not meant to make you feel good and express your identity. It is a collective institution that is struggled over that we are trying to use for our, uh, you know, for our political cause. We're trying to use for the cause of socialism. We're trying to use it for the cause of anti-racism and so on. And if we leave, Leaving shouldn't be an individual thing. This is a collective. Uh, this is, you know, the, the party is a collective force, and that's the reason why we should stay in it. But don't get too upset if we have a few losses and there are a few more outrages because there's so much else going on besides. Thank you so much for that, James. It's important, isn't it? I think the doing the work outside the party is as important as inside. Okay, um, Maya. Last but not least, over to you. Thank you. I completely agree with James. It's a battleground, not an identity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was a really, really good point. I do disagree with him, though, uh, on the uh, just turn up to vote. You should turn up to every branch meeting and every CLP meeting because your presence there is what keeps us going. I mean, having something that you go to regularly with the same people, it keeps us together. And that is really, really important. So although you, it's it's painful, the bureaucracy, even in a party controlled by the left, the painfulness of the bureaucracy, I, I understand it. But, you know, nationally, we need to focus strategically on winning. Locally, we need to forefront as much as we can these local campaigns that are going on uh, and other things that interest us and speakers and, and foster that community. But I do think that you should turn up to your meeting. So that was the question. That was the um, answer to number one. Why should we reinstate JC? Because he's a great leader who united the UK left. He's a figurehead of hope. We, we He has to be reinstated. Um, and how to organize in right wing CLPs are so much solidarity um, because I know it, it's so tough. It, it's horrible. Um, you know, it's a very, very hostile environment. But what I would say is make links with your uh, neighboring CLP left. Um, keep socializing with each other, make links with the unions, local unions and get involved in their campaigns and what they're doing. 
um, and yeah, counter their hostility with comradeship, um, I think, and don't internalize it. Um, as James said, you know, it is not an identity that you are subscribing to. It is a battle that is being fought out in every CLP in the country and you're part of a movement. And at the moment, um, we are doing really well. You know, we're, we are still the strongest group of socialists in Europe. Uh, so hold on in there. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, we are still in the party, the biggest um, grouping of the you know, membership is people that joined between 2015 um, and, and today. So I think people should take some, um, you know, some heart from that, that we are still the majority. But I absolutely agree. Um, turn up to your meeting, spoken like a true CLP secretary there. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, well, I hope everybody has enjoyed tonight's event. I think the speakers have been great. Great questions, too. So um, all that leaves me with now is um, saying thank you and good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye.